I'm a little girl and I've got a little beautiful box with a lid and it's actually made of power shell, the um, iridescent shell from the abalone. And it's got kind of flecks of that in it. And I had, I used to keep lots of little special things in that box. And so I would kind of lift the lid and it had this really nice, very satisfying kind of, it fit very tightly. And I just kind of lift that lid off. And I had all these little treasure, treasured items in there. And I had some little ponamu earrings with a little gold stem and um, a little section of greenstone that I kept in there with some other little goodies but that was my little treasure box or my wakahuya ko maya jessup nukuaho ko tainui te waka ko rangiahua te maunga ko wainui te awa ko torere nui arua te tipuna ko ngaitai te iwi ko maya jessup nukuaho tēnā koutou katoa That's Maya Nuku curator of oceanic art at the Met She's in the business of looking after treasure. Nephrite jade has been prized by every culture that's ever found it in a riverbed. The stone is cool, smooth, and dense, harder than steel. When you strike it, it sings. And the sound is somewhere between metal and stone. It comes in colors ranging from brown to white, but you probably know it best as a brilliant shade of green. It's long been treasured in both China and Japan. To the Olmec in what's now known as Mexico, the green stone was the first breath of the earth. The 11th century Persian scholar Biruni wrote that wearing it could protect you against lightning strikes. And in New Zealand, jade, or ponamu, can be an anchor, even as you sail away. It's almost like the beating heart of Māori culture. Ponamu is this hard, durable, you know, dense, weighty material. But what Māori are asking of it is a fluidity and an ability to kind of, you know, move with them. It's a living thing because it is something that's harvested from the from the earth so from the kind of beating heart of the earth from the metropolitan museum of art this is immaterial i'm camille dungey today we look at the agency power and meaning of jade in aotearoa new zealand There's this really important early ancestral narrative about Ngāhui leaving Hawaii with his greenstone fish, Potini, and traveling across the oceans to arrive in Aotearoa, or these two large land masses that he encountered. They make one landfall and then carry on up and over round to the west coast of the South Island, which is now called Te Waiponamu. And he leaves Potini there safely in the river there. And then he returns to Hawaii and tells of this incredible rich landscape that he's just encountered. And he, he takes a small piece of the side of Potini back with him. And so he's telling everyone back in the ancestral homelands in Hawaii about this incredible place. So he starts to carve toki, adzes, is, um, as well as adornments, so kurupo namu, ear pendants, and, and heitiki. The heitiki that lives at the mat is a jade pendant that's deep green, solid and cool, a bit larger than the palm of your hand. Made to be worn around the neck, the figure is upright. Its head tilts to one side. Its eyes are made of power shell and embedded into the sockets with bright red sealing wax. It has a wide, heart-shaped mouth, and its eyes hold your gaze. It's really encapsulating that extraordinary moment where new life is birthed. There's something very embryonic about this sculpture and the way that it's conceived. 
it really mirrors the way that a woman births a child, but it also encapsulates the child itself or that embryonic force that's coming down that dark passage to be born into the new world. And so that open mouth and the flaring of the nostrils and that wide open eyes is really evoking that that sense of vitality. We say, tihei modi ora, you know, it's like, this is life. So it's really all of that energy encapsulated in this beautiful, dense stone that you can hold in your hand. When you get to like an embryo, I guess it's pure, isn't it? Before, before that baby's been born, you've got a pure little soul there. And I, I, I wonder sometimes if the heitiki represents that part in, in people and adults that childlike, pure, spontaneous way. Lisa Ruaka Riwiti is the public programs presenter at the Wanganui Regional Museum on the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. She's also in the business of taking care of treasure. If Polynesian were cruising around in the islands for like 5,000 years, you know, coming out of East Taiwan, they did a hell of a lot of traveling, but Right from the get-go, they took that human embryo form with them. How long have we been in New Zealand for? About a 1,000 years. And that's what they're bringing with them when they turn up, you know, when they voyage over. So I guess it's still still a connection. It's that connection to their past. And if it's a baby, it's a connection to the future. And if an ads, a tuki is first arrivals in a new country, then when you start wearing the human form or an embryo form on your body as an art piece, that's settlement. A lot of the tanga or treasures at Lisa's museum were donated by her family. But one of the most important family tanga doesn't live at the museum at all. She's a heitiki named Terona. I can always remember Terona. Growing up, Lisa's grandma would tell her the story of how Te Rana was made. So there was a prophet, his name was Tahu Portiki Ratana, and he kind of had his own religion thing happening about five kilometres out of town. And he called it the Ratana faith. And so people were turning up and he was healing them. And someone came with a piece of tangiwai. It was quite a rare type of green stone. So he was given this piece, this rock, as a thank you for healing us. And he had three heitiki made out of the stone he was given. And then he gave one of those heitiki to my grandmother's aunt, grandmother's mother's sister. In 1924, Lisa's great aunt wore the heitiki for her Hakka group's world tour. Brass band, glamorous destinations, and a taonga along for the ride. And when she came back, my grandmother, Nana, was right into her Māori stuff. And her auntie Kata handed her the heitiki. And Nana said, well, why are you giving it to me? You've got, you've got your own children. And auntie Kata said, because you are the only one who shows an interest, who goes down to the marae, who's always at the pōhiri, always welcome to guests. So, and you will do wonderful things with this heitiki. So she gave the heitiki to Nana, and then Nana said, what's her name? And Kara said, how about we call her Terona? It means around, because she'd been around the world. For nearly 70 years, Terona was in the care of Lisa's grandmother. She'd ring you up. She'd go, she'd go, hello. You'd be like, hello. Um, it's, it's, it's your grandmother here. Morty, Riwichi, Ruaka, Logan. <laughs> As if you didn't know. <laughs> but hi, Nana. Lisa's already an animated person, you might have noticed. But when she speaks about her grandmother, she really lights up. And you can hear in her voice that Terona is just one link in the chain that holds them close. Nana was very good. She was very good and very pious. She was very tidy and very clean. And she went to church and um, she was never mean about anybody. She was always beautifully dressed. So she always had perfect makeup. She always had these perfect eyebrows. She always had these, she had these massive towel on tight, really strong fingernails. 
Lisa has an old portrait of her grandmother following in her aunt's footsteps. That was for um, a special occasion. She'd been chosen to be the soloist performer for a kapa haka group, representing, um, you know, Whanganui. And um, the photograph was taken then, and Nana's stepfather carved the frame. In the portrait, Lisa's grandmother gazes just over the photographer's left shoulder. She looks cheerful and a little shy and almost impossibly young. That was 1937. She'd have been about 19 or so, yeah. It's a beautiful photo. The frame is circular with power shell embedded in it to give it life. Her grandmother is wearing her kapahaka uniform, a headband, an off-the-shoulder cloak, and te rauna. Seeing the same heitaki Lisa wears in an 80-year-old photo is a dizzying reminder of the way that Tanga can travel through time and space, leaping out when we least expect it, to remind us of the past. In my 20s, I saw an exhibition of large-scale portraits of Maori women by a studio photographer called Samuel Carnell, who had a studio in Napier in New Zealand, and they totally blew my mind. Maya Naku again. I just saw in these women this amazing kind of clash of cultures, this encounter. They were wearing these beautiful Victorian black silk and taffeta and kind of moiré silk dresses. And they had ribbons in their ears um, and they were wearing ponamu, heitiki. They had nihomako or shark's teeth earring, some of them. Uh, another image had this pair of huya feathers in this young lady's hair. And they had the mokokowai, which is the tattooed chin and lips. And I was really struck by them. They were going to this studio to have their photographs taken because they saw all these Pākehā women, you know, European settlers in the town having their photos taken. So it's, they're very strong images. You know, they're really like looking out at you and they really aren't shying away from this moment where they're just taking the best from both cultures and really kind of owning it. And I found them very uplifting and positive and just really, they really changed my life. When she says they changed her life, she's not exaggerating. She went back to school for master's degrees in art history and visual anthropology, and then a PhD in Pacific history and visual arts. Those photos are what brought her into museum work. In the moment that I saw them, a lot seemed to kind of make sense to me about these different aspects of my own life. I guess they kind of just animated this other part of me, you know, growing up overseas in London, but having Māori heritage and kind of just straddling these different worlds. They set me down this track, and I always describe my discovering the research and avenue that I've been led down towards where I am today as polishing off these rough facets almost like a diamond and that you just kind of embrace all of them and then you just kind of create this new you which honors all those parts of yourself. Maya and Lisa are both Maori and Pakeha, European New Zealander, and through their work have found ways to blend those parts of themselves. So has Dan Hikuroa. But rather than going through a museum, his path runs deep underground. My name is Dan Hikuro, uh, kei te mahi au, uh, te whare wānanga o Waipapa. I work at te whare wānanga o Waipapa, Māori Studies Department, the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Dan's a geologist and earth system scientist. In his work, he integrates science with mataranga Māori, or Māori knowledge. So, ev- even though, you know, if people look at my name, uh, and maybe if you can kind of read faces, you might see I have some not strong Polynesian features, but once you know people say, oh, okay, yeah, this guy's this guy's definitely Maori. I, I effectively grew up in a Pākehā way, in a New Zealand European way. 
and so I didn't I wasn't exposed to um, ancient knowledge. I didn't I didn't sit on our our, our marae and and just by being there absorb uh, this knowledge and these ways of of knowing, being, and doing. And so, Ponomu was something that was absolutely fascinating to me from an early child, but that I had no relationship with. It was this kind of thing we saw at the museum. But I didn't. I didn't understand that that the relationship with it, where it came from, uh, its importance. His relationship to the stone has come a long way since then. As a metamorphic rock, nephrite jade is the literal foundation of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a huge part of his life as a Maori geologist. Potamu, like uh, many minerals and rocks in the earth, forms when you get the right ingredients get put through the right conditions. It's kind of like baking a cake. The ingredients for ponomu are found in many places around the world. But, you know, just because you have some flour and eggs and milk and butter, that doesn't mean you necessarily get a cake. To get that cake, you need the Easy Bake Oven of New Zealand's boisterous subduction plates. The plates aren't great at sitting still. They like to move. A lot. Now, from about... 120, 100 million years ago, uh, New Zealand decided it had had enough of being next to Gondwana and it began to break off and set off on our own. Gondwana is a supercontinent that used to encompass much of what's now the Southern Hemisphere. Sort of like a tectonic Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. The band started to break up in the Mesozoic period. And like many newly solo artists, when New Zealand left the group, it went into a bit of a decline. So our, our rocks cooled off, and remember, we're sitting on a molten mantle. Uh, the rocks slowly sank through time to about 25, 30 million years ago, where we almost sank altogether. Uh, and there were only just a, a small percentage of the landmass we have now was, was above water. If we come forward a few more, kind of 10 or 15 million years. Just a hop, skip, and a jump in time. I, I know, it's easy for a geologist to just throw numbers out. That's when a new plate tectonic boundary formed. Think of it as New Zealand's epic comeback album. The country started to rise again on the volcanic back of the Alpine Fault. And as those rocks were melted, crushed, and driven upward, a spine of Ponomu was formed. All the country's greenstone is found along the Alpine Fault, but one of the largest deposits is in the Arahura River. This is one story of how it got there. And it starts with a greenstone fish you might remember. Potani was a tanifa, or a water-like being, the guardian of Ponamu. He feared another tanifa named Whaitipu, who was the guardian of Hinehoaka, who was the goddess of sandstone. Pounding by Whaitipu could flake Potani and injure him seriously. Hence, he feared them immensely. Once, Potani was being pursued in the sea by Whaitipu and took refuge in a bay at Tuhua, now known as Mere Island in the Bay of Plenty. There, Potani observed a beautiful woman named Waitaiki coming down to the water to bathe. Enthralled by her beauty, he captured her and swam towards the mainland. When Tamatiahua, uh, Waitaki's husband, discovered that his wife was missing, he used karakia, or incantations, in the art of divination with a small dart-like spear called a tika to find her. He threw the spear up into the air, set a karakia, and then wherever the uh, spear landed, it pointed towards the location of Potani. So when Tamatiahua cast his dart the first time, it pointed towards Tahanga. And so there he went, but Potani had realised that Tamatiahua was coming to capture him to retrieve his wife from that place. So Potani fled down the centre of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so from Tahanga, Potani went to Whangamata. They jumped the main strait of the archipelago, landing on the northern tip of the South Island of New Zealand. From there, he went to Rangitoto Kititonga. Potani's flight streaked across the coast and up toward the northwestern edge of the South Island. To Whangamoa, Onetahua, Everywhere they stopped, Potani lit a fire to keep the captive Waitaki warm. And then down the west coast, 
of the South Island to Mahitai and Takiwai in South Westland, which is almost all the way down uh, the west coast of the South Island, before turning back to a place called Arahura. And at that point, Pautini went up the Arahura River with Waitaiki and Tamatiahua realised that he'd been fooled, turned around, came back up and realised that Pautini had taken Waitaiki up the river. Pautini realised that he was trapped and fearing capture but refusing to give Waitaiki up, Pautini turned her into his own essence, into Ponamu and laid her in the riverbed at the junction of the Arahura River, a major river on the west coast, and a nearby stream. That stream became known as Waitaiki. Dan says that the story is great for kids because of the epic flight down the coast of New Zealand before Waitaiki is turned to stone. But behind the chase scene, all those fires Potani lit were doing deeper work. Each one of those places where Potani stopped with Waitaiki where Tamatiahua came searching for him, is an area where you'll find a stone. So in in effect, it's like a resource map. It's like a treasure map. It tells you where those different places are. The power of story is a huge part of passing on knowledge in Maori culture. It also creates an elegant ability to shift through multiple dimensions. If we think about Ponamu, it is a traveler through time. You know, it was it, the precursor ingredients were erupted into ocean floors hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, and then it came through this next phase where it was squashed and rent and torn and put under immense pressure and temperature uh, to form into the Ponamu uh, up in the mountains. Ponamu has seen so many things through its time. Uh, and then as it shapeshifts through through the efforts of, of natural processes and then through human processes, it gets imbued with those different things as it shifts itself through that time. And I think that's maybe part of why uh, we value it so deeply is that it can tell us so much and can reveal so much. You know when you love something so deeply that it's hard to imagine a time when it wasn't there? It feels like no matter what might separate you, there will always be a rush of recognition when you meet again. Like coming home. Our long, long past ancestors came out of Asia. That's unequivocal now. And so I couldn't help, the romantic in me couldn't help but think, Man, maybe maybe this is a long forgotten treasure and we've just found a new a new source for it. My relationship with it has deepened and has has shifted to one where I see it more as a taonga, not in a in the noun sense of treasure, but in the verb sense of to be treasured. And I think that's that's where I sit with Ponamu now, is it's not just a thing, it's an act of treasuring it, as opposed to it just being a noun or a thing that we can kind of lock in a treasure box. That came up again and again. Ponamu is almost impossible to keep locked away. When we come back, we'll hear more about why that is and the role museums can play in setting treasures free. Have you ever held a piece of jade? It's heavier than it looks. When it's been sitting out, it's quite cold. But when you pick it up, it warms as if to greet you. Smoothness of that stone, if it's water-worn, if it's been made into something and and smoothed off, it's just one of these materials that you, you just feel like touching. Take it from an expert. He literally wrote the book. It's called Tehetiki. Kia ora, I'm Dougal Austin. I am a 
My title is uh, Senior Curator Mātauranga Māori at Te Papa Tongarewa Museum of New Zealand. My whakapapa is to the south of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I whakapapa with the, the iwi, the tribes of uh, Kāti Māmoi, Kaitahu and Waitaha. Dougal's whakapapa, or genealogy, includes the iwi Kaitahu, for whom Ponamu is a protected tango which can only be found in their South Island tribal region. So like Lisa, in many ways, he's also caring for his own treasures. Museums are complicated places, and Te Papa is no different. Colonial history means not everything in a collection was ethically acquired, and many of those things will never go back home. Dougal says that's why it's critical that museums employ Maori staff who are able to properly care for objects, not just physically, but spiritually. For example, if we go into our collection storerooms, we say a karakia, which is a, like a prayer, and we follow certain tikanga or protocol for working with the taonga, so we don't step over them. You know, it's about res- cultural respect. And if we bring a group out, if we take a group in, if we bring a group out, then we have a running water nearby, which removes the tapu. The tapu is like a sacred sacredness from the association with the ancestors. And then you're free to go on your way. This is a shift that began after the Met's Te Maori exhibition in 1984, where for the first time in an art museum setting, curatorial decisions were Maori-led. The role of a museum historically was, you know, like... They weren't really places for indigenous people. They were places where cultures and material culture of those cultures was collected and studied by authorities, you know, (laughs) ethnologists and the like. But he says they can and should be more than that. As times change, colonial institutions can be both safe havens and launching pads for Tanga, keeping them connected with their network of descendants. Lisa Riwiti agrees, with some caveats. When Dougal put together the Ponamu exhibition, he asked if, if Te Rauna could actually go in that exhibition, which essentially meant that I wouldn't have her for five years. And I said, no. I said, no. I said, you have all of these unprovinced heitiki that you can use, but this one is still living. My heitiki is still alive. And if I put her behind glass, then I'll kill her. All the warmth will go. They, they, need, they need the warmth. So what does that mean for a heitiki that may never see their families again? I feel for those heitiki. I really do. Sometimes that, that's impossible. You'll never be able to find the area that it came from to be able to take it back to. So it will, it will always be in the museum. And those heitiki are cold. They're cold, you know, and, yeah, I feel sorry for them because they, they like being worn. This one loves the limelight. For that reason, Tehrona isn't just Lisa's ancestor or her family treasure. In some ways, she's also her co-worker. The great thing, the great thing, the one thing I really enjoy about having her is that she is essentially a museum piece. And with every other museum piece that we have, you look at it behind glass. But if I'm teaching, um, say, an education program about Heitiki, then they can see my Heitiki. And um, I had a class in of 12-year-olds all Māori and Pacifica children, and I was doing a heitiki program with them. And they were so chilled, these kids. You know, they were, you know, giant, giant 12-year-olds all bigger than me. So all sitting on the, on the map, and they were so into it that I took Te Rauna off, and I said, I'm going to pass her so you can see how she feels all the way around. And so, you know, and, and if I'm, which is not what you normally do with a heitiki that's, that's, that's insured for 50000 But I trusted these children and I knew that it would make their experience so much, um, so much more. And I said, the only rule I have is that you hold her with two hands 
and don't snatch. No one snatched. They, they were all so gentle and sweet. Lisa says she sees this tenderness a lot in her work with young people. We've got a couple of, we call them po. You know, they're like carved people on posts. They kind of look human, but not necessarily. Some of them have big faces and they've got the moho on the face and stuff. Some children, like three-year-olds, will go up to that, that carved po, that person, and they will talk and hug and kiss them like they're seeing a, a live person. And when you pull out a couple of features in a carving that children can relate to, then they will relate. They'll make those connections. You know, Whanganui carvings always have big round eyes. They always have their hands in their mouths because we hold on to our stories. We're careful about what we share and who we share with. And the toes and knees are always pointed inwards. And that's because we're a river people, usually standing in a boat, going up and down the river. If your toes and knees are in, your balance is better. So, you know, big eyes, hand to mouth, toes and knees in. And they're like, oh, that's one of ours. They belong to us here in Honganui. So children have a great sense of pride, particularly Māori children. So Māori children can actually, you can give them an opportunity to excel at being Māori. And that's the work she's willing to take Te Rauna off for. Hopefully, if, we, if I do my job properly, in 20 years there will be young adults, Māori and Pākehā, from all over New Zealand who will see value in writing any roles that have come from colonisation. Museums are changing. The galleries that once held Daunga in glass cases alone can also be sites of transformation. In 2019, Maya Naku put that into practice in a Met exhibit called Atea, Nature and Divinity in Polynesia. There's one Fijian artist, fiercely talented uh, performance artist and choreographer, Jara Wasasala, and she conceived and performed a 20-minute piece in response to all the Taonga in the Pacific galleries. And the piece was really very powerful and explored her own feelings of, of pride at the mana and status of these Taonga that were, you know, on display in the galleries. And her joy at being reconnected with them really came through and finding them here in New York. And it also plumbed the depths of her melancholy and that fractured sense of loss and grief at the disconnection and the rupture um, that, you know, colonialism has affected. So it was really moving and it allowed a space for those of us from the Pacific to be able to really feel and express that grief inside the museum, you know, there in the gallery amongst and alongside all, all our ancestral treasures, you know, with our ancestors there. For Maya, Tanga are never truly dead, but sometimes they go offline and it's her job to bring them back. And they're designed to be very mobile and that mobility is enacted throughout their lives. The issue with museums is that that trajectory gets halted. And so you have this situation where things were gifted and exchanged and then, you know, Europeans acquire them and then they get caught up in another system which then puts them in a vitrine and the line kind of stops. And so the challenge for us as curators and for institutions is, you know, how do we keep those ley lines open? The answer to that question, she says is just as important as the climate control and maintenance that protect the Tanga's physical bodies. Kaitiakitanga is a concept, you know, of guardianship and custodianship. It's about physical care, but it's also about metaphysical care. And that's where museums and institutions have tended to focus all the energy. It's on the physical care of collections, which is vital. But then we have to think again about the conservation of cultural heritage and, and allow them to breathe. And so there has been that idea, I think, that we preserve and we document and we classify and we keep things safe. And I think we need also to acknowledge that we're now operating in an environment where we're looking after the metaphysical safety of collections on behalf of people, on behalf of people from all around the world, 
Despite being a crucial part of Polynesian culture, the Met's Heiteki lives in the Asian art department. That's because it came into the museum as part of the Heber Bishop collection, which features primarily Chinese and Indian jade. Before arriving at the museum in 1902, almost everything about the Heiteki's history is unknown. That makes me feel that much more close to this Heiteki because I kind of want to nurture it because it has had that link kind of broken. And so to reunite it with the rest of the Oceania collections will be really wonderful. Once an object enters a museum, whose knowledge systems should determine where it belongs? And to truly reckon with the colonial history of museums, what needs to be reevaluated? It's a question with many answers. But it's worth remembering that these objects were never meant to be static. There is a way of thinking about some of those Tonga as being ambassadors, as traveling overseas to create a connection with the homeland in these other places. And so the galleries in New York, to my mind, when we host Pacific peoples in our galleries, the space of the gallery really becomes like a little piece of an island. It becomes an an island. She says that learning to hold treasure with an open hand is a crucial lesson, one that Daunga themselves can teach. Remember Maya's treasure box, her wakahuya? Waka means vessel, like a canoe. The secret is mobility. Our ancestors didn't make it across the oceans, you know, by being restrictive about the culture. Actually, they were thinking in this very expansive way. You have lots of stories in the central Polynesian archipelagos, which which are really the ancestral homelands, Hawaii. Um, parts of islands kind of break off and swim through the ocean and then anchor themselves in other parts to create uh, another island. So you have this kind of splintering off of the land and then the people follow. They follow in their canoes or their waka. What happens when a gallery becomes an island anchored by a beating heart of stone? It's a piece of New Zealand 10,000 miles away moving in Maori space and time. And that's what ritual protocol does. That what That's what the chanting does. That's what the singing does. It just kind of animates everyone in the moment. In a sense, it stops ordinary time and you kind of move into this extraordinary time where the ancestors are with you and they're guiding you. In Pacific Island cultures, there's a concept called walking backward into the future. Spread your arms into a V and look forward. You're facing your ancestors, and they won't let you fall. You know where you've come from. You know where you've been. Because even though you're walking backwards into the future, you are using what you learned in the past to enable you to do it. And your eyes are open. I'm Camille Dunchy, and this is Immaterial. Immaterial is produced by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Magnificent Noise. This episode was produced by Adwa Jimma Brimpong and Rachel Smith. Our production staff also includes Jesse Baker, Elise Blinner Hassett, Eleanor Kagan, and Eric Newsom. And from the Metropolitan Museum, Sarah Wombold, Benjamin Corman, Rachel Smith, and Douglas Hegley. This season would not be possible without Sophie Anderson. Sound design by Ariana Martinez. Mixing by Ariana Martinez and Kristen Muller. This episode includes original music composed by Austin Fisher. Fact-checking by Christine Baird. Sensitivity listening by Chanel Clark. 
Special thanks to Celia Joe Olson. The podcast is made possible by Dasha Zukova Niarkos. Additional support is provided by Bloomberg Philanthropies. This episode would not have been possible without James Doyle, former assistant curator for the Art of the Ancient Americas. Navina Haider, Nasser Sabah Alamad Al Sabah, curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art. Maya Naku, Evelyn A. J. Hall, and John A. Free, curator for Oceanic Art in the Michael C. Rockefeller Wing. And Courtney Smith, senior research assistant in the Department of Islamic Art. To see portraits of those 19th century Maori women Maya Naku mentioned, as well as Lisa Wuiti and her grandmother wearing the Heitiki Tehrana, visit the Met's website at metmuseum.org. I'm Camille Dungey.